Well, it's time to catch up with Mac McGuinness now. A lot of people would be wondering, like, uh, you know, uh, how does someone decide to leave the city? So what city were you in? And to go to Tassie, going agricultural, starting up a, a business, and you weren't really farmers, were you? No, we weren't farmers at all. I um, actually worked in marketing and advertising and Ollie, my partner, was a lighting designer for festivals and things. So we had no agricultural um, experience at all. Um, but we just knew that that was the kind of lifestyle that we wanted just from going on holidays or, you know, camping, even things like that, just to have a little taste of it. So, yeah, we definitely knew that's where we wanted to be. But the select Tasmania, like where were you living when you decided to go to Tassie? Well, we were living in Roselle, which is um, Balmain, so um, in the west of Sydney. Um, we were sharing a house with like five other people. We had this tiny backyard, but we thought that's big enough just to build a little greenhouse. So off we went and um, got some reclaimed timber and bought some um, greenhouse plastic and whipped it up um, but we had to build it within um, the confines of the backyard so the top of the roof is actually flat because it couldn't be higher than three meters so it was like exactly the size the limit size that we could have and then yeah we just started testing microgreens um, we jumped on YouTube and we started following some people who'd done this before and we just gave it a go um, and then we just started selling into some cafes and restaurants and going to the markets across the road at the school. Um, but then one day we just decided, it was like April actually, so 2018, that we were just in this kind of holding pattern because we knew that we wanted to be in Tassie eventually um, and we were just kind of not really doing much in Sydney. Um, so we thought, okay, let's do it. So then June that year we moved to Tassie. Uh, communication. So I work at the university um, at the Institute of Agriculture. So yeah, I do their events and communications. You're, you're full on in the farming now, aren't you? Yes, <laughs> I'm deep in the community. <laughs> okay, so tell us about uh, being prepared for the startup environment and particularly in a regional context where you, you probably wouldn't have known very many people at all. Yeah, so I guess our business is a little bit different. It's not really a startup. For us, it was um, a complete lifestyle change. So it just had to work. It wasn't, there wasn't an option for failure, really. Um, the regional context was a little bit tricky because, yes, we didn't know anywhere. So the place that we actually moved into was not ideal, but we had no idea what the correct area was in Tassie, but we just made it work. Yeah. We're looking at programs like River Cottage and stuff like that saying, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Oh, definitely. Do you know Gourmet Farmer? Um, he's the bloody celebrity down here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tell us about Husky Greens and did it benefit from the Tasmanian Produce Collective? Yeah, so the collective that we're a part of um, is a group of about 30 like-minded producers in Tassie um, and we all work together. It's actually a cooperative. Um, we all work together to get each other's produce um, out to more Tasmanians. So we have um, an online farmer's market that we all um, are on and then um, we sell to customers and work together to get the produce out to regional areas especially. Um, we find that people are really trying to get their hands on fresh local produce, but it's really hard in these places that they call food deserts where there's not a lot of access to fresh produce. Okay, so you're, you're targeting regional businesses now, but is there a plan to go up another layer to becoming a national operator? Um, it's really tricky for us because one of our key pillars is that we um, are environmentally sustainable. So actually um, getting things transported to the mainland or um, internationally um, has a lot of carbon emissions. So we really want to um, try and just contain it just to Tasmania if we can. Down the line, we might look at um, exporting, but right now we're just yeah really focusing on local. Well, Mac, what does it mean to be a real organic business? You know, you, you made the point that you're, you're really serious about your environmental footprint, that you won't even send stuff nationally. So clearly this real organic business means something really important to you. What's the definition of a, a real organic business? 
Um, well, I guess um, if we just look at normal organic certification at the moment, um, it still means that things might be sprayed with um, organic certified pesticides or herbicides. And those things still um, kind of kill the beneficial microbial life and insects and things that are on the crop. So we don't use any sprays at all. And um, we want healthy soil. So we work on um, increasing the health of our soil through things like biochar and adding um, amendments rather than spraying anything. We also use cover, um, covered poly tunnels to help protect the crops. Um, and we're also a big believer of using animals as well to help regenerate um, the soil. So I guess in many ways, what you're doing is very costly in the, the short run, um, you know, because you're not using the kind of things that improve productivity of an agricultural business, but come with those, you know, chemical implications or whatever. H have you been able to master the, the higher costs and effectively bring those costs down over time by improving your expertise? Oh, definitely. Um, we definitely still have a bit of wastage, but we try and use that wastage in a beneficial way. So we actually use it to feed our sheep um, rather than buying sheep food. So we're getting a cost saving there. Um, we're also testing different crops um, throughout the seasons to see which ones stand up to um, different kind of pests um, better and which work better in our climate. So yeah, over over time, we're gradually getting this like list of solid crops that um, work really well for our business. It seems to me that you would be engaging with like-minded small businesses through the collective for starters, but also from a point of view of potential customers, there must be restaurants and chefs out there that really want to get what you're, you're producing. Has that become a, an important part of the growth of your operation? Yes, so chefs um, are a massive part of our business. Um, so we um, try and just have a really personal relationship with our chefs. We always ask what they're looking for. Um, we always get feedback from them. If there's any issues, um, that relationship is super important to us with the chefs for sure. Yeah, and have you been able to use them in a sense as influencers to, to show other people out there that your produce is really highly accepted by, I guess what you might call a tough audience? Yes, definitely. So some of them are actually celebrity chefs <laughs> down here. And when they do a post um, on their Instagram using our produce, that's huge for us. So um, they always want to support Tassie local Tassie producers. So whenever they can, they're posting or, you know, telling other chefs about us. It's all word of mouth, really. Do some locals call you blow-ins from Roselle? <laughs> yes, some of them still call us bloody mainlanders. I don't know if you ever become a true local down here unless you're born here. <laughs> The country regions can be pretty tough in accepting city slickers. Let's go to yeah. um, the next five years for Husky Greens. What's the what's the plan? So at the moment, we're just preparing to move further south to um, a place called Jeepston. Um, we're actually going to be farming a piece of land that's owned by the Jeepston Community Centre. So that's a huge um, step for us because we've always wanted to work directly with the community and having um, this relationship is going to mean that we can have access to um, volunteers, but also run some workshops, which we're already doing. Um, we've got the support of all of the community down there. So that's kind of the next six months for us. Further down the track, we definitely want to own um, kind of quite a big block of land and implement some regen ag um, principles on there and potentially create an agritourism business. And, you know, um, my partner, of course, wants to grow lots of food and he wants to <laughs> have a little cafe and things, but we'll have to talk about that because I'm not keen on that idea. <laughs> so so do, you have, um, do you have any outside advisors, like, I'm just laughing at, you know, uh, your partner's got an idea, you obviously got another idea. Do you actually yes. have a mentor or a coach or uh, an agricultural expert that actually comes in and helps you talk through the viability of big ideas? We definitely do. So in 2020, we did a program called Sprout. Um, so they're quite a big organisation down here who are all about helping um, Tassie produces um, basically 
get to the next step that they're after and they have um, advisors who you can have access to. Um, so also part of the TAS Produce Collective, there's the other board members um, who are also advisors to us. It's amazing what you can learn when you get to know people in your industry. Exactly, yeah, and it's all about those relationships with people in our industry because in Tassie, um, you just can't jump online and find something. It's all who you know. You just have to keep talking to people. Yeah, okay. Look, uh, let me uh, go to our other panellists and uh, let, let's go for, for you, example. for example, Alex. Have you ever thought about making the big shift from the city and doing it all from the country? Um, I kind of do already, actually. Um, so I grew up on the Mornington Peninsula, which is about an hour and a half out of Melbourne, um, and then moved to Melbourne to go to university and for most of my um, like professional career. And when COVID started, my um, partner and I and our two little kids decided to get out of our shoebox in St Kilda and move back down to the Mornington Peninsula. So we're um, on a, a large-ish block down here now and um, have been able to make that work through Zoom and flexible working arrangements. And so, yeah, I think we'll be staying down here. Yeah. Do you think you've, you've become better at business because you're in a different location? I think we've um, just proven that it is a workable option and maybe there was some doubt in in us my business partners and i um that we could sustain the same momentum in the business without having to be in the same physical space together but covid kind of forced everyone's hand there and for our business at least it it was a success so um it's given us the confidence to continue so one day you might say it was the lockdown you had to have. Yeah, absolutely. I know we never would have done it otherwise, honestly. So, yeah, for us there was a small silver lining to COVID. Okay. What about you, James? Have you ever thought about giving up the big smoke and heading to the, the green fields of the bush? Um, so I've done the reverse of Mac. I grew up in Tassie and uh, surrounded by nature. And so that's a, yeah, it's definitely a big part of my life. I love, um, you know, nature, but um, yeah, I guess where my journey sort of led me is to move into the big smoke and um, uh, sort of settle in here. And uh, a lot of it's probably the, the nature of the clients and where you're sort of working and um, because ours is, um, you know, high touch and um, personal and, and, you know, that face-to-face -face relationship with the clients, um, you know, they want to kind of meet you because you're sort of managing their wealth, um, you know, and, and you kind of, you know, part of their families and businesses. So, um, you know, they need to see you face-to-face -face and, um, definitely we saw a shift with COVID and, and you know, being more online and uh, a lot of Zoom meetings or whatever um, technology you've got running there. So there is a, a bit of a shift there, but I just don't believe that it would ever kind of fully replace the human connection that you have when you meet someone. But I think it could, um, you know, effectively lead you to, yeah, be, be in the bush or, or be anywhere and still you know, at least maintain clients. So, um, yeah, I think maybe an extended holiday uh, or extended time in a remote place like Tassie, um, but probably boots on the ground here for me. Yeah, it is interesting that you make the point that people do want to be face-to-face -face with their financial advisor. But, of course, because of the coronavirus, many meetings would have become um, Zoom meetings. Uh, or, and so uh, I guess a lot of your re retiree customers, they must have had to go into a steep learning curve of the, the new technology of Zoom. <laughs> I was laughing because I think everybody's had that, uh, that kind of flashback where, uh, either it's a parent or a grandmother or, or somebody and you're trying to kind of talk them through. But I was really surprised at, um, you know, how quick um, some sort of, you know, 90-year-olds, et cetera, 80-year-olds uh, were, were, you know, in 
grabbing the new technology and, and doing it better than a lot of lot of other people. So, um, yeah, I think that really surprised me and at how readily people were um, happy to do a Zoom now. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of had to put my own biases aside, I think, to do with that. Uh, and um, it's definitely changed the way we can work. So, yeah. <laughs> As I've always said, James, if anything's worth doing, it's worth doing for money. <laughs> I think your customers <laughs> clearly wanted to embrace technology to look, make sure their money was well looked after. 